Hello, my dear ones. Um, I'm smiling like an idiot because it is a very beautiful morning on Iona. And uh, that's really why I wanted to, to film right now, so I can share with you some of the, the joy I feel, both inside myself and outside somehow. It's not particularly sunny, but it's a beautiful, beautiful morning. Let me show you. I found this little place where I could hide, although it's very close to the abbey. I think you can see the silhouette of the abbey just, just there uh, against the sky and the sea. And that land that you see beyond the sea, that's the Isle of Mull, where mothers and their monastery is located. And um, I don't know what else I can show you, not much at the moment. Um, somewhere around there are young mothers. Um, young sheep with their lambs, but I'm keeping a safe distance from them because I don't want to trouble them, I don't want to startle the little ones or the young mothers, and out of respect for the farmers as well. So anyway, uh, I'm here on a cliff, hidden, um, out of view, with a microphone quite um, unsafely balancing on my knee, hopefully it's going to stay there, and I want to talk to you about about the saints of these islands, very, very briefly, because they are so meaningful to so many of us, particularly those amongst you whose uh, descendants come from either uh, Scotland or the larger UK or Scandinavia, this, this Western uh, European part of the world. <clears throat> a few days ago, someone left a message with a question uh, on the chat board of our online community. The online community uh, link is always included uh, in the first comment of all our videos. And the question was, are there any practices of the saints of the islands <clears throat> specific to them which we could incorporate in our spiritual lives? And I've taken a bit of time before answering the question because it goes very deep and it's very close to home, so to say. Um, I've, I've worked for the last close to 15 years now to establish these monasteries on Mal and Iona. And in this time, I have developed a deep, personal, um, spiritually intimate relationship with some of the saints here. And I've become increasingly reluctant to speak easily, lightly um, about them. And indeed my understanding of their lives has changed from reading about them to actually living where they've lived and facing some of the challenges they have faced. Um, oh, there's a little mother. Just a second. Do you see her? The young mother. And she just blocked the view to the little lamb. He's there somewhere. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> if they come any closer to me, if they feel safe enough to come closer, then I will, I will film a bit more later on in the video. I think what the saints of these islands have to offer us is very different from the eccentricities that are being listed in all the hundreds of books and booklets that have been written about them. Yes, those eccentricities, those spiritual um, strangeness, that spiritual strangeness about the, the uh, spiritual lives, they are real, they are there. But if you end up practicing them, even for a little while, and if you open your heart to understand truly where they come from, what you learn is that instead of being some sort of strange spiritual eccentrics of their times, they were actually extremely traditional monastics who had to adapt the traditional ways in which monastics everywhere else were doing things simply because of the eccentricities of the actual context of where they lived. So a very basic example is that, yes, they, they could not wander into the desert for 40 days because they did not live in Egypt. But they knew 
very well of the practices of the Egyptian monastics. So if they couldn't wander into the desert, they wandered into their own desert, which was the sea. So they made up um, that specifically, so to say, Celtic tradition of having monasteries that are floating for days or weeks or indeed years, or the specifically Celtic tradition of having sailing hermits going out at sea. The outside of the practice seems eccentric and specific, but the content of it, the depth of it, and the fruit that they were out to get from it was actually the same as the ones that um, the monastics in Egypt were out to receive. So, <clears throat> having prayed to them all these years, uh, more than a decade, and having gone past the kind of shallow um, spectacularity, <laughs> if that's a word, of their practices, what I've grown to learn about them is that, and what they can offer to us Christians today, is that they became, in fact, the perfect example of balancing an absolute freedom in relation to rules and outside practices and traditions, while at the same time freely in in a way that uses their free choice, their free will, they've freely enslaved themselves to the same practices so that they found new ways in which they could adapt and put into practice these things in their own lives. So, for example, you and I, we cannot wander again in the desert of Egypt. And we cannot take our boats and just disappear for 40 days onto the sea. But we can find other ways in which the fruit of these monastic practices would be available to us, of course, to a different degree, but still nevertheless available. We can hide in our rooms, we can go on pilgrimages, we can create a prayer corner in our gardens, in our workspace, in our sheds. Uh, we can wake up at night and, and pray the way that they did as well. What I'm trying to say is that I see in the saints of these islands the perfect balance of these two wings, freely chosen enslavement to the tradition that was built and offered to us by the Church in the centuries and indeed millennia, in our case, um, that went before us, while at the same time retaining this wise freedom in relation to the actual forms of those practices. So you don't fall into idolatry towards a tool because these practices in and of themselves are nothing but spiritual tools. You don't fall into that idolatry, but at the same time you don't fall into self-idolatry, which is what happens to any Christian that thinks that he or she can reinvent everything without any consideration or obedience to what happened before them. I mean, all... I don't like putting all Protestant Christians in one bucket, but this is pretty much what I see in most of you when I meet you closely. I see beautiful people who nevertheless fall into self-idolatry because you don't have an alternative. It's not your fault. It's simply what, what happens. It's the end result of churches whose tradition basically says that there is no tradition. If you do not understand that Christ's church goes all the way back to Christ, if you don't understand and respect and humbly bow, bow down before the fact that the roots of who you are today go back through each generation, through the fathers and the mothers of the church, all the way to the apostles, all the way to Christ, then what you end up doing is, 
eventually, whether you want it or not, is you fall into self-idolatry because you end up deciding what is right and what is wrong. You end up deciding what practices are still relevant and how to apply them and what practices are no longer relevant and the reasons why you shouldn't apply them. And that's not what Christ has taught us to do and it's not what his friends, the apostles and the martyrs and the saints, have taught us to do all these centuries. The saints of these islands had found a way to balance the fact that they belong to Christ's one church. They were part of the church. They were not these um, avant-garde Protestants that we've built them up into being nowadays. They were part of the church. Obedience was one of the main things, one of the main themes of, of, of their spiritual lives. Obedience and spiritual um, struggles, asceticism, keeping night vigils, fasting to the point of angels having to show themselves up to them, to tell them to temper it down because they shouldn't destroy their bodies. All these things that are almost like uh, the devil for most Protestant um, Christians nowadays, they were not part of their lives, but their very lives. And yet, they had not fallen into the trap of becoming just, um, you know, barren traditional Christians who can only talk about rules and regulations, but have very little life and spirit in themselves to, to prove the life that hides behind these practices. Because they were completely at ease, completely free to take these traditions and these practices and apply them to the reality of their lives, which is what we see in Christ and in the Apostles and in the Fathers as well. It's only us, only the Christians of the latter times, that are tempted by falling into either self-idolatry by deciding that we can reject everything that came before us because our churches were created, I don't know, 500 years ago, as if the other millennium and a half that preceded whoever founded my particular church didn't exist. Those, those centuries are just not there. How that's possible for someone to believe is beyond me. And that eventually leads to self-idolatry because you become, you become the one blind man leading a blind man. Leading, in fact, you become the one blind man leading the same blind man because you become your own guide. You become your own um, axis in your spiritual life. And that's nothing but self-idolatry. And remember that there's not much difference between making an idol out of rock, like the rock behind me, or an idol out of, I don't know, iron or gold, and worshipping that, and worshipping yourself. Because you, my dear brother and my dear sister, are just as transient, just as much made of nothingness as this stone behind me. Self-idolatry does not differ in any way from the idolatry of the Old Testament. And even the God, the God and the teachings of God in the Old Testament showed how much God hates this sin of idolatry. And that's one way of falling. And the other way of falling is by <laughs> idolizing and building an idol out of rules and regulations and empty traditions that have no life in themselves. The saints of these islands were enslaved enough to the tradition that preceded them to humbly learn everything that was to be learned from that tradition. And yet at the same time, they were free enough to adapt that experience to the practical reality of their own lives. They were not some sort of um, avant-garde, Protestant Christians walking romantically on the coasts of these islands while meditating on some sort of uh, Zen Buddhist philosophy that we've 
readily engulfed and um, swallowed up as being no different from our Christian faith. They were well-established, well-rooted Christian monastics, rooted in the tradition that preceded them in the, the Christian past, that also had the freedom of spirit to adapt those practices and traditions to the reality of their lives. And this is the only way that we can fly spiritually. You need both wings. You need the freedom from the world, the freedom from your own self, to enslave yourself freely to the tradition and the teaching and the experience of everything Christ has to teach us through those who went before us, while also having the freedom from the shapes and forms of these traditions, the freedom to recreate them, reshape them and adapt them to the reality of your own life. Anyway, I pray some of this makes sense to your hearts and I pray some of this touches you enough to just ask yourself, what on earth is this monk talking about? What is this church that he talks about that existed, you know, for one millennium and a half before my Protestant church was even created? Just have a look. Just have a look on Wikipedia. Nothing more than that. Start with Wikipedia, my beloved one. And that's going to open a universe to your heart. I have nothing but love for you. I have nothing but prayer for you. And I send all that love, all that prayer, all that light that God has given my heart for you. Wherever you are, may it reach you and just engulf your day in joy, in love, in light, my beloved ones. Amen, amen, amen.